before we start, we're just going to get the cute stuff out of the way. <laughs> Great start. Uh, okay. Time for serious newsreader voice. In early November, there was a sad farewell at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. The departure of two beloved pandas who were being sent back home to China. The question I have been asked most in the past few weeks is, are you sad? Um, and the answer is a very, it's a very simple yes. This was a big deal for locals. The zoo's pandas had kind of become a symbol for DC. They're the zoo's most famous residents. There are panda statues around the city. And for a while, pandas were featured on Washington DC's train tickets. Yes, the pandas have really become a part of life in the Washington area um, and in part of the life of America. The departure of the pandas was met with an outpouring of grief. They're just the sweetest. I just love them and miss them, and I really hope we get more. I started crying because I never got to see a panda in person. This wasn't just a sad thing for panda fans. It was interpreted as a big deal for international relations. Now the Chinese are angry with us, so it could well be possible that they're trying to send a signal. See, the DC pandas aren't the only pandas on their way home. Five years ago, there were 16 pandas in zoos across America. But by the end of next year, there will be none. The UK's pandas left in early December, and Australia's are due to leave in 2024. And you see, the pandas aren't just pandas. They're diplomats. You're friendly to China, you get a panda. You criticise China, you get no pandas. And yet, just hours after the pandas left Washington, the Chinese President Xi Jinping surprised everyone. He hinted that he might send new pandas to America very soon. Now, why am I telling you about pandas? Well, internal politics in Beijing is notoriously difficult to discern. And the withdrawal of these pandas, followed by the sudden change of heart, may indicate something really important. After several years of hostility, China might be returning to a more peaceful relationship with the West. But why? And why are pandas the key to understanding it? I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. Just quickly, before we get stuck in, we're doing a survey about the show. You'll find the link in the description below. And uh, if you want to tell me exactly what you think about me, now is your chance. And for those who did the survey last week, message received. Okay, back to pandas. I wonder if you've noticed just how many delightful animal stories there have been this year. Well, not enough, 1960s newsman Ross Simons. Not enough. We'll do better in 2024. But this panda story isn't just another animal story. Panda diplomacy is real. It started in 1972 with an unlikely friendship. See, in the early 70s, pandas were incredibly difficult for Westerners to see in person. Wild pandas only exist in China, and as China was almost entirely closed to Western tourism, you couldn't see the ones that were in Chinese zoos. There was only one panda in the Western world, a beloved panda named Chi Chi, who lived alone in London Zoo. In a way, it's kind of surprising that they exist at all. They're not all that good at being like alive. Uh, like koalas, they are a cute, cuddly, hot mess. Pandas spend 14 hours a day eating an enormous amount of bamboo. Pandas munch through 16 kilograms of bamboo a day. But here's the thing. Eating bamboo is a terrible idea. Pandas are bears. They have the gastrointestinal system of an omnivorous bear designed to eat meat and fruit. But at some point in the past, their ancestors lost the ability to taste umami, savoury food, which appears to have led them to just giving up eating meat. Instead, probably due to its availability, they started eating bamboo. Yum, 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 yum. But their digestive system didn't adapt to digest and extract nutrition from, like, wood. 
They're still anatomically carnivores. They're no more suited to eating bamboo than we are. But imagine your life if you, a human, had to eat 16 kilos of bamboo every day. Any time they don't spend eating or sleeping, they spend doing what I can only assume are extremely painful bamboo poos. Anyway, the point is, despite pandas being very famous and everyone loving them, it was incredibly hard to actually see one. Enter Pat Nixon, wife of US President Richard Nixon. Well, I've often said to young candidates, or they always ask my advice, uh, I say that first pick the right wife. Foreign trips were Pat Nixon's forte. She was a hit wherever she went. While organising President Nixon's China trip, Mao's second-in-command, Zhao Enlai, specifically requested that Pat come too. The presidential jet with President and Mrs Nixon aboard will touch down on Monday for the start of the historic American mission to China. The point of the trip was to normalise relations between China and the US. We can have differences without being enemies in war. While her husband sat in meetings, she hit the streets of Beijing in a bright red coat. Her schedule was to go out and, and be with the uh, Chinese people. I mean, we made arrangements for her to visit a Chinese kitchen in one of the hotels. Uh, we went to schools. While out and about, she went to Beijing Zoo, where she saw her first ever panda. Well, I certainly have enjoyed my day. That night, at a state dinner, she was sitting next to Zhao and Lai. On the table in front of them was a cigarette box with a picture of pandas on it. She told Premier Zhao that she thought they were cute. I'll give you some, said Zhao. She asked if he meant that he would give her some cigarettes. No, he said. I'll give you some pandas. On behalf of the people of the United States. Just weeks later, Pat Nixon was at the National Zoo in Washington to see the pandas arrive. Hello. Hi. Just checking to see how the panda thing went. I've been in a meeting and so I was Oh, they checking. were just darling. Thanks to President Nixon's obsession with taping all of his conversations, we have access to this call between him and Pat on the day the pandas arrived. Were you able to get up to them? Do you pet them or things like that? Or they don't allow that? Or how does it no, work? No, they're glass cage. Yeah. They're comic little things, you know, they yeah. act yeah. up. And... Do they really? Oh, yeah. It was a scream. By the end of that year, as other US allies like Japan, West Germany and Spain recognised Beijing, they received pandas of their own. 1972 was named by American media as the year of the panda. Oh, yeah. Over the following decades, pandas would arrive in foreign zoos at key moments when China wanted to improve relations. In the wake of the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989, where international media and governments criticised the communist government for killing and imprisoning pro-democracy student protesters, another wave of pandas was sent out. In Taiwan, an offer of pandas from the mainland became a massive political issue with the major parties fighting over whether they should accept them. In 2007, when Chinese economic growth was at its height, Beijing was keen for a closer relationship with Australia. China's growth is very good for Australia. And they weren't just offering to buy our resources. Buy gas, get pandas free. President Hu's promised a breeding pair for Adelaide Zoo, with the hope babies will come in 2012. So, I believe that this will certainly become a new symbol of our friendship. China sees pandas as a symbol of their country. But by the 1980s, habitat loss had left only around a thousand of them alive. China became determined to rescue the symbolic species from extinction. Their plan to do that is through a global lease program. Pandas are no longer given as gifts. They're leased for a million dollars a year each. The point of the program is to generate income for panda conservation in China and to generate new pandas. The lease agreements say that the zoos have to encourage the pandas to breed and that any cubs the leased pandas have are the property of China. The thing is, getting pandas to breed is a problem. <laughs> Female pandas can only get pregnant for a day and a half 
a year. And with the critical reproductive opportunity lasting only 36 hours, there's little time for romance. Now, in the wild, they've figured out a way to make this work. Studies of wild pandas show that in the weeks leading up to the fertility window, female pandas enjoy watching the males battle for dominance before mating with the one who wins. They've been doing this for nearly 20 million years. It works fine, apparently. But in a zoo, there's no weird furry season of The Bachelorette. Adult pandas are becoming more sedentary and less interested in sex. There's usually only one male and one female. And without the whole ritual, they're both far less interested in mating. And also, they don't seem to know what they're meant to do. They did get very close. Um, they were really working out um, the positioning um, and you know what it was that they were needing to, to work on together. Zookeepers do what they can to um, show the pandas how it all works. You can sort of get panda porn on, on the TV. Um, you know, I'm sure you searched that in YouTube. Um, you know, do, do it from your home computer, uh, not of your work one. Panda porn is something that has been used for decades now to try and convince them to mate. Zookeepers also try artificial insemination, but that's only marginally more successful. This has led to a strange situation where a quarter of all captive pandas are descended from a single male panda named Pan Pan, who apparently knew what he was doing without any help from Panda Hub. Oh. I won't bother going into the other problems, like panda penises are too small, they have random gestation periods, or that they often have twins but can't care for two babies due primarily to the fact that they have to eat a dining table every day. Yum, 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 yum. But zoos around the world are getting better at it. And by 2019, there were 600 Chinese-owned pandas alive in captivity in 19 countries. I just had sex. But then, the era of warm and fuzzy panda diplomacy suddenly came to an end. There were a lot of things that heralded the souring of China's relationship with the West, but if you look hard, the clearer signal came in the form of a diplomat named Zhao Lijian. Lijian Zhao, thank you very much to have joined us today. Zhao Lijian didn't like how the United States was treating China. They are trying to bully uh, China. We have to fight for our honour and dignity. We have to uh, fight for our interests too. In 2019, he told Pakistani State TV that trying to bully China would backfire. If you are trying to bully China, uh, China will fight to the end. He decided that he would personally do something about this. But how? He was a relatively unknown civil servant in China's embassy in Pakistan with little influence over anything. So he turned to Twitter.com. Initially, he basically just used Twitter normally, chatting to people, retweeting interesting things, posting photos and videos of things he saw around Pakistan. But the fact that he was a Chinese official using Twitter to do anything other than just post official press releases led to him gaining a big following. By 2019, he had more followers than all other Chinese diplomatic accounts combined. But when the international community, including the United States, started criticising China for its treatment of Uyghur Muslims in the far western Xinjiang province, Zhao accused the US of hypocrisy, saying they are still a racially segregated society. Zhao tweeted that parts of Washington DC are off limits for white people and that quote, there is a saying, black in, white out. The US didn't like this at all. Former US National Security Advisor Susan Rice responded by calling Zhao a racist disgrace and shockingly ignorant. She demanded that Beijing remove Zhao from his post. Instead, they promoted him. Zhao Li Jian is no junior Beijing player. He's the second ranked official in the foreign ministry who speaks with the authority of his nation. His appointment was a sign of a shift in Chinese foreign policy. They weren't going to cop criticism anymore for cybercrime, for intellectual property theft or global pandemics. A foreign ministry spokesman is now openly peddling without any evidence a claim that the US Army sent the virus to Wuhan. When Australia criticised China's human rights record, 
Zhao accused Canberra of hypocrisy by tweeting a graphic of an Australian soldier appearing to murder an Afghan child. Don't be afraid, the soldier says. We are coming to bring you peace. It is a false image and a, a terrible slur. Zhao became the face of the new form of Chinese diplomacy. Wolf warrior diplomacy. Wolf warrior. An aggressive approach that repurposes the muscular, nationalistic sentiment of a Chinese movie franchise. The tagline of the Wolf Warrior movies is whoever attacks China will be killed no matter how far the target is. It went beyond tough rhetoric and threats though. China unleashed cyber attacks and sanctioned imports from Australia. There were skirmishes between Chinese and Indian soldiers on their shared border and requests to extend leases of pandas in western zoos were turned down. But wolf warrior diplomacy kind of didn't work. Western countries continued criticising China and just copped the economic penalties. Meanwhile, the Chinese economy suffered from decreased cooperation with the West. After three years at the top, Zhao was shifted into a job with no public contact. Something to do with oceans. And it seems that the wolf was abandoned, making way for the return of the panda. In 2023, Xi Jinping travelled the world, rebuilding relations with India and the UK. China started importing Australian goods again. And after taking away the pandas from the National Zoo in Washington, Xi Jinping indicated that pandas would return, following a positive meeting with the US President Joe Biden. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that China is about to give up on its ambition of invading Taiwan or unwind its human rights violating program. But it does seem to mean that they're not going to be quite so touchy about it when people call them out. Anyway, whatever. Pandas. The Adelaide Zoo's contract is up in November 2024. Unfortunately, no amount of panda porn has helped their residents breed despite 15 years of trying. But we really like these pandas, so can we keep them, please? Hey, thanks so much for watching if you're listening. I hope you liked this episode. If you've got a sec, we're running a short survey about what you like or what we could improve about our show. I haven't convinced my boss to put in a question about whether I should have my top button done up or undone in future episodes, but we are basically trying to figure out how to make the show better for next year. You can find a link to the survey in the description below and you can also check out heaps more of our episodes on our playlist. I'll catch you next week.